Good day, everyone. I'm really pleased to have you here joining me for this presentation here at FOSS Backstage. Uh, this is my third FOSS Backstage, obviously the first virtual one. Um, I wanted to uh, start my opening remarks by letting uh, everyone in the audience know that one of the reasons why I um, felt particularly uh, responsible uh, for, for bringing these messages to our community is I recognize my own enormous privilege in that, uh, you know, I am a, I am a white, well-educated woman working in the tech industry. And therefore, uh, when I am facing the challenges of uh, living in Corona times <clears throat> and the stresses that that brings to all of us, I'm doing so from a, from a place where um, my position is relatively safe and secure, though, though my life may be difficult. And I wanted to give voice to some of the experiences that other folks um, are having who are not in a position to be able to critique the system or the, uh, the modality in which they operate because they do not have that same privilege themselves. Um, just a couple quick words about myself. Um, I am currently working as a manager in Red Hat's open source program office. I've been working in the open source space for almost 20 years now. And um, this talk is just uh, me sharing my own personal experiences uh, as a parent in the times of Corona. Um, this isn't any uh, reflection of my uh, employer's thoughts on the matter, although um, I guarantee there will probably be a couple of love letters to, uh, to Red Hat during this talk, just because I think that the way that they've handled working with their employees during the pandemic has been superb. So to get into the meat of our presentation for today, um, it should come as no surprise to anyone uh, that we live in very tender times. Um, life is very, very difficult right now, and it's not simply the global pandemic. Um, even before we were <clears throat> all uh, putting our lives on hold and adjusting to the new normal that is uh, the, the coronavirus, the, uh, the world was a very challenging place to live in to begin with, right? We had uh, global civil unrest, including in places where I think many folks didn't expect to see civil unrest occurring, such as in the United States, where I'm originally from. Uh, we had uh, global trade wars escalating. We have, were noticing the strains of uh, the uh, globalization impact and how that had stretched our supply chains. And as we searched for economies of scale, that left our ability to be resilient in times of crisis uh, impaired. And then so, so that all sort of exploded and was brought together when, um, when, in fact, a moment of crisis challenged that overall resilience to our global systems. And now here we are living uh, you know, through a global pandemic while in the meantime, all the other sources we may have had of sort of existential angst or stress remain, right? We're all still wondering how we're gonna provide well for ourselves and our families. We are all still probably concerned about the impact of climate change on our futures. Uh, the number of displaced persons worldwide continues to grow due to climate change, um, global conflict, et cetera. So, it is not as though we are only experiencing the stress of our changed lives in the pandemic. Life was already pretty stressful to begin with. And now in our, in our new normal, and my thesis is actually that we have reached, we have reached an almost impossible challenge as individuals um, in order to simply cope with the, the stresses of our daily life. And hopefully throughout the course of this presentation, in addition to bringing to light some of those challenges, I will also be able to give share some ways to. Um, <laughs> this is not staged, I promise. Okay, beloved, I am right in the middle of giving a talk about parenting when your little one is at home because of Corona. Do you need me to help you write this second, or can mommy help you in five minutes? Write this second. Write this. What do you need help with? So I need the Tony said like the eggs. Okay, can you bring me the basket of Tonys and I will find no, it? No, yeah, no. Any more Tony's in there, so I've the time all these pieces. Okay, honey, I can't do this right this moment. Okay, do you want to sit on my lap? No, I want to sit on your You then to look for it on your back in our box. Here is a demonstration of love and parenting in the time of Corona. For the sake of actually being able to continue this presentation, I'm gonna go help her out real quick and come right back. And I am very sorry to everyone who is participating in the live stream. Excuse me, I will return post haste. Parenting crises shown here actual size. Thanks everyone for your patience. Um, so as I was saying before my untimely departure, um, 
hopefully throughout the course of this presentation, in addition to identifying some of the challenges that many of us are facing and helping to uh, create some empathetic uh, interactions around those challenges, we'll also talk about ways that we can help build resilience in ourselves and in our communities as we face this nearly impossible challenge. So one of the goals that I have with this talk is actually to make, to make the invisible visible. And what I mean by that is, um, I think we've all read enough think pieces about how we have Zoom fatigue and we are exhausted by only meeting folks on video and we don't have the same sort of dopamine reaction with uh, video-based communications as we do with in-person interactions and how that is, is causing um, a global level of exhaustion in how we interact with one another. I think we've all read uh, the articles talking about how um, there's been an increase in uh, job loss, economic disturbance around the virus, et cetera. Like we, we, we have an understanding that these things are going on, but if they don't, if these problems aren't necessarily directly impacting us, I don't think we have a good sense of what it means to have these, these particular experiences. And, and one thing that has deeply rooted in my own experience of living through Corona was a talk I had very early on with a good friend of mine about the challenges that I was facing as a parent and um, how how my time was bifurcated and it was very hard to focus and all of the same things that many other people are experiencing. And, and her response was to say, I think that this is the first time that people really understand what it's been like for me my whole life living with a disabled spouse. And that to me was extremely profound, right? The I had known this person for many, many years and I had known that they had a disabled spouse and I was sympathetic to that, but I did not have any kind of understanding of what that meant on a day-to-day -day basis for that person's life because I had never experienced it. It wasn't because I lacked sympathy or care. It was because there was no real way to have that understanding having not lived through it myself. And so that I'm hoping that by sharing some of these stories today, I will be able to make those invisible things visible and tangible to each of us as an exercise in growing our empathy. So <clears throat> here we are in days where um, to say that childcare options are scarce, I think is a, is a generous way to put it. Um, uh, we are in a, in a situation where for the first time, uh, there are many, many people worldwide who are doing their work where possible from the, the, the comfort and safety of their homes, but they're also doing it where there are no actual resources to help them care for their offspring. And this is, <laughs> This is considerably challenging because you get interrupted while you're giving presentations at great conferences like FOSS Backstage, or you're simply in a constantly interrupt-driven environment because you have the to handle the needs of your children uh, while handling your own needs as a person without the usual resources you may call upon in order to make your precious time resources stretch farther, such as being able to go out to eat for a meal instead of cooking it at home yourself, or being reliant upon um, other childcare options uh, that are no longer available to you because you can't invite someone over to watch your kids in the afternoon if you have an important meeting, uh, because that's just simply not something we're doing anymore. So, I've, and I and I bring this this point to the fore because I think we're all probably now used to um, somebody's kid bouncing into one of our meetings and and being really um, you know hopefully generous and accepting of that as as part of our new normal. But what I, I think is invisible to some extent is the uh, just the enormous mental pressure that comes with the feeling that you're uh, you're in a position where <clears throat> you are not able to give the amount of presence that you want to to your children, and you're not able to give the amount of presence that you want to to your work, and that you are you are uh, effectively failing at both of your endeavors, right? Which can be uh, have a, a really negative psychological impact. On an individual because you know we are creatures who like to succeed and where we feel like we are trapped in a situation where we can cannot succeed because we cannot do well for either side um, it can be uh, exhausting and a, and a drain on our mental health resources um, and additionally I don't want to um, to suggest at all that the only folks who are, are struggling with care responsibilities are those who are caring for children. I'm, I myself am caring for children, but I also have several elder care responsibilities as well. And I know folks who have uh, much deeper elder care responsibilities um, to, to parents or other um, aged loved ones. 
And you know, one of the stories that I wanted to to share today was my um, my Red Hat mentor. Actually, um, at the start of the pandemic, uh, his family made the choice to have his his father move in to their home because they were concerned that he would not uh, be as safe living in a senior citizens center. And so not only was their family coping with the need to bring the children into the home, adjust to homeschooling, a whole bunch of different responsibilities there, but simultaneously now elder care responsibilities were a part of that and all within the scope of a home that was never designed nor anticipated to be one in which there would be another adult living in that location. Um, and it, it, there's also something to be said for the the overall, again, talking about items of um, overarching concern. You know, as we look at news reports about what is happening uh, worldwide with the state of the infrastructure that's meant to care for our elderly populations, those infrastructure resources are straining. The, the businesses that have uh, chosen to be in the area of caring for senior citizens have found themselves uh, financially devastated due to the requirements for coping with the pandemic that have exponentially increased costs while the folks that they care for are typically on a, on a fixed income and there's a an op, there's a very good chance that there's going to be some huge destabilization in our ability to rely on uh, social infrastructure that has been created to care for, uh, the elders in our lives. So, you know, again, the uh, the impact of the pandemic is not just about our, our our youngest, most vulnerable members of our society. It's about our elders and who, uh, who are on the other end of the spectrum of most vulnerable members of our society. Um, additionally, you know, as we are facing all of these challenges, um, I would say mental health res care resources are scarce or, or non-existent. Um, as somebody who uh, believes that mental health care with, uh, you know, professional services is an extremely important part of my own self-care regimen. Um, you know, I am fortunate in that I had access to mental health care resources prior to uh, Corona ever becoming a part of our lives. And yet, I know many, many people who, because of the pandemic, they felt very emotionally and healthy and secure prior to all of the changes. And now that these changes have taken place, they are looking for additional support and help around their mental health and well-being. And unsurprisingly, there are not sufficiently available trained professional resources to cope with the increased demand for mental health care that have come about because of the pandemic. So while we are now coping with extreme stressors, completely different new, different situations than we were used to to handling an unprecedented change in the way of, of, you know, just going about our daily life in a time when we were all fairly stressed even before Corona came to us. This is this has been something that is is hugely devastating um, to folks because when you find that you are in need of care and you go to ask for it and then suddenly discover it is not available, that is um, it's just it's a dire situation to be in. Um, and while we're talking about the, the challenges faced by folks during the times of Corona, I, I want to be really clear um, that the, the impact of the pandemic has disproportionately disenfranchised and negatively affected women, um, hands down. So if we look at our life outside of the time of the pandemic, I think it's, it's pretty clear and very, very well documented um, that, you know, household work or the domestic economy uh, falls disproportionately to women, you know, the expectation is that women will do mo m much of the household labor um, as opposed to their uh, their male partners. And, you know, that was a, a difficult situation, which I think a lot of folks in society were attempting to negotiate for, for quite a while and, and looking to bring about positive change. But in the wake of the pandemic, the strain that that creates has become that much more manifest. Um, you know, I remember uh, at the very start of lockdowns back in, March of last year, I mean, I would literally spend five hours a day doing laundry just because if we left the house to go get groceries, you know, every single article of clothing clothing needed to be cleaned. We all took a shower. You know, this was the, the current guidance and having that. And that was simply one of the household tasks that needed to be done. Now, add on to that cooking three meals a day when before one might have gotten takeout food or not needed to do that because people would be outside of the home for some of those meals. And that was not a responsibility that fell to someone in the home. 
uh, you know, keeping the place clean, making sure that there are clean dishes, et cetera. All of this disproportionately impacts women because women are, are typically expected to be the ones in the household who are doing that work to begin with. And it is not as though uh, more time resources suddenly became available in women's lives at the start of the pandemic to take on all of the, these increased care responsibilities. There's also the um, unfortunate fact that what we, we look at as short-term challenges um, are actually incredibly negatively impactful to women's careers long-term. So we are seeing a record number of women uh, leaving the workforce in order to stay at home and perform care work for children or for um, aged relatives. Uh, more often than not, women are the ones making the sacrifices when it comes to their careers as opposed to their male partners. In some cases, that is because uh, their male partners earn more because of the well-documented uh, wage gap between men and women's earnings. So we have a systemic problem of the wage gap coming in and impacting women's ability to be successful in the future because since the wage gap existed and their labor has been valued less economically, they are therefore the ones to drop out of the, the workforce and then take the economic hit of then trying to re-enter the workforce later, competing for jobs when those jobs are able to be taken by several folks who wanna re-enter the workforce, potentially um, not having the opportunity to go back to the same work or at the same level of seniority as they did before. And even for those who do not drop out of the workforce, who remain in professional employment, there are just simply not the same set of opportunities available to you when you are um, trying to uh, do, your, <laughs> do your best to be an effective human being during a global pandemic. Um, you know, just sharing my own experience, I've been um, working very hard on a uh, management track promotion at Red Hat for a while now, working in concert with my manager. We had a great plan, several projects that we were going to complete, stuff to execute. That's fantastic. And I've chosen um, to deprioritize working on a promotion track this year because simply because it is not possible for me to do the kind of work required to advocate for my ability to be promoted. Okay, so that's fair, and that's a and that's a choice that I've made, and it's a reasonable choice to make. But what that means is effectively there are, there's going to be one to two years where I should have been in the ready to be promoted, ready to move my career seniority up, my earning potential up, etc. That are they're simply gone, and they're simply gone because um, you know this short term challenge actually it ends up having a very long-term effect because the, the choice if the choice is between um, career trajectory versus family care versus the ability to perform some sort of self-care by not you know uh, burning myself out trying to do too much in an impossible time you know the, the choice to me is obvious right it's it's care for my child and it's uh, it's care for myself so while we are thinking through um, the, the challenges that women are facing right now today and how you know it, it sucks uh, to be the one who gets interrupted during your Zoom meeting because our, you know, your children more often than not will probably ask mom where their, uh, <laughs> where their Tony is and not someone else in the house. Um, it's not just the, the day-to-day -day, uh, difficulties, it's that what we're experiencing right now is going to have long-term cumulative effects on our careers. And you know, we're, we're working and trying to uh, do our very best to continue being effective in this new normal um, against the backdrop of realizing that we are taking a serious long-term hit while we are struggling um, to, to make things, you know, work day to day. And I think the, you know, the hardest thing for me as a professional woman, and I, and I know that I echo this, I echo a sentiment that I've heard expressed many, many times um, in one-on-one -on -one conversations with friends over video, um, no matter what you do, no matter what choice you are making, you are always choosing to either neglect your work and be less successful there, neglect your family and be successful there and potentially have long-term repercussions in terms of your, um, you know, your offspring's emotional, mental health, their cognitive development, et cetera, and yourself, right? Something no matter what, is being sacrificed. And sometimes it's all three of those things, um, just simply to continue to maintain. And that is, a, that is an extremely, extremely uncomfortable position to be in because I think 
um, given the choice, uh, you know, none of us <laughs> would would choose to sacrifice, you know, would choose to neglect those things. Uh, and certainly for women where, you know, we, we have, uh, again, well-documented uh, tendencies to prioritize our own needs last uh, when it comes to uh, either care for our families or making sure that we excel in our careers. You know, now we're at, we're in a position where it's not only a question of whether or not our needs are prioritized last, it's a question of whether we're going to meet our needs at all um, because some of us are trying to squeeze in our ability to get our jobs done at three o'clock in the morning before the children wake up and then, you know, again at 8 p.m. at night uh, until, you know, midnight in order to get our work done after they go to sleep. So, um, again, as I've said before, you know, this is this is a near impossible challenge that we face. So, um, so enough gloom and doom and enough and enough it hurts. Um, what is it that we can do to, to, to improve these matters, right? There, clear, there has to be a light at the end of this tunnel, it's not a train. So the first thing that I would I would advocate for is, is to start with empathy, right? When you're when you're interacting with your colleagues and your your coworkers, please try to be empathetic about their situations um, based on what you may know of them as human beings or what they may have shared with you. So you know, a couple of hot takes, um, gentlemen. If you are in a meeting with several of your female colleagues whom you know have children and whom you know do not have partners who. Uh, who do not work outside the home, right? Do not do not spend five minutes of your meeting ranting about how hard it is for you when the kids are at home, when you have a partner at home who also helps you with all of these tasks and does not have full-time work because it can make things very uncomfortable for your female colleagues who are um, navigating the exact same situation you are but do not have the resources of an additional pair of hands or partner to, to focus on those domestic uh, economy needs. Um, and also, you know, for for those of us who who don't have children who are seeing kids bounce off the walls during video conference meetings, um, remarks like that's why I didn't have kids are not super helpful. Um, it may be true. It's not necessarily the best thing to share at that moment in time. Um, and I would also like to say that, you know, for those of us who are struggling with these additional care responsibilities that are that are new and unprecedented, also having some empathy for our colleagues who are not necessarily facing that challenge, right? Like it is very clear to me that there are folks on, um, you know, my team or within my company who they don't have children and they are working a lot harder, much, much harder to fill the gaps that are left because those of us who do have um, family care responsibilities are not able to give as much as we once were, right? And and having some empathy and some kindness for the amount of stress and pressure that they are feeling to perform because we are not able to give as much as we once did, I think is really important too. And being and not only being empathetic and aware of it, but thanking them for taking that time to support us and, and being really clear that we, we know that that is happening and that we acknowledge it and we're grateful. Um, create environments where, where real talk is safe, right? Uh, I am very fortunate that, you know, I, the, the company I work for encourages real talk and open communication and the team that I work on also um, values uh, people bringing their whole self into the office. So uh, I absolutely encourage folks to create work environments in which people can just be honest. Like if you're having a horrible day because, you know, you joined the bad moms club because your kid finally cut off all of their own hair because you were in a call too long in the morning, this did not just happen to me on Monday. No, <laughs> right. That someone can talk about that and talk about the feelings of insecurity they're feeling and talk about the, the guilt or the hurt that they're feeling like they're neglecting their child and they're neglecting their work at the same time, right? We need to be able to have a place where we can express the truth and the reality of what we are all experiencing at this time. Uh, <clears throat> and because, <laughs> because our normal social support systems are not functioning as they once did, so much of our social interaction is now being driven through, through our work and our, our, office, our office engagements. So, you know, rethink what professionalism means to you and give, give a place for people to actually just be themselves and, and perform real talk and just continue. Um, normalize care responsibilities. So, um, you know, I think it should be, it is, it is incumbent upon every uh, workplace to make sure that it is very, very clear that it is understood that there are care responsibilities um, that come with 
uh, being in a and being in a pandemic, and that there are going to be times when we are going to need to give time to the elders in our lives, to the children in our lives, to our fellow fellow family members, etc. Even even needing to take a mental health day because it's all just a bit too much, right? And and normalizing that that is a thing and that it is it is valid and that it is real um, is important, right? We cannot we cannot say to everybody, oh, you know, we think you're all going to do fine, and then you know. Uh, negative, you know, ping our coworkers and back channel and say like, it's not cool that you missed that meeting. You know, we know you had such and such happening with your, you know, your grandparents, but it really wasn't okay that you were there. Um, last but not least, if you are in a position of leadership or management, I think it's incredibly important to make uh, revised performance expectations explicit. So if, if it is clear to you that you do not expect your employees to be able to perform at the level that they normally did, that's great. And it's wonderful to say that. But it's also really important to have conversations with each of your individual employees about what they reason can reasonably accomplish given their own constraints and to make sure that they understand that their performance is going to be judged according to very specific criteria that you're going to work with them so that they can meet it. Right. Um, because unfortunately, you either get folks who are going to uh, exhaust themselves by trying to overperform in a situation where they don't have enough resources because they're not sure what target they're trying to hit. Right. Or you're going to have folks who, because they don't know what is expected of them, they're going to feel a, se a sense of paralysis and freezing because they just, they do not know what is expected of them. They think that they have to perform as they have always performed in challenging circumstances. And because that is a recipe that is doomed for failure, uh, they, they end up being not able to do anything at all, right? So just, just be really clear on what you expect people to be able to do. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's fine to hold people accountable even in tough times but make sure that you're holding them accountable for something that is reasonable, explicit, and agreed upon. Uh, and last but not least, I know this is silly and cliche, but just give yourself and everyone else around you a break. Um, you know, it's okay if your kid cuts off all their own hair because you were in meetings all day. It is okay if one of your coworkers, you know, didn't get back to you immediately. It's okay if someone misses a meeting. It's okay if the talk that you gave at a conference wasn't the best talk you ever gave. Um, you know, we are all doing the very, very best that we can. And if that, you know, that that has to be enough because it is all that we have to give. So if you find yourself um, being really critical of other people, try to give them some grace and do your very best to extend that grace to yourself as well. And then the last point that I want to make, because I, I think it's a really important one, is um, I think we all need to spend, all as human beings and as, as citizens of our respective countries and as citizens of this planet Earth, um, we need to rethink about the way we, we structure our world. Um, because what we have discovered in this time is that our social systems, our supply chains, our um, economic systems, our, our um, social safety nets, right? Um, they don't have the kind of resiliency built into them that is required for uh, times in which our we are facing global challenges and we really need to rethink about how we structure, how we approach life in order to ensure that it, should we find ourselves in, in these tender times for a long period of time or again, um, that we're able to make better choices that allow us to handle adversity in a more sustainable way. Thank you all for listening and for your patience with my uh, interruption, and I believe we may have a minute for questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul, uh, who may have. Some yes. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you. We don't actually have any questions yet, but um, a lot of people uh, expressed that they they totally understand. And you said you you hope that people will accept those situations and being interrupted as kind of as a normality. And our audience mm -hmm. has truly done that and um, the comments are wonderful and they are sending uh, there are these emoji reactions you can't see them um, but I've been watching them and a lot of hearts been bubbling up all the time so <laughs> um, yes thank you very much